this thing about this, this um, purported violation, I'd like to kind of just summarize what had happened. <clears throat> After uh, Mr. Olson, the Olson Trust bought the property in 2015, they did do some uh, land clearing <clears throat> of some Albizia trees in that area. So during the course of the land clearing in September of 2015, they inadvertently discovered a tomb in that area. And so the work kind of stopped. Work kind of stopped. Then they had an archaeological inventory survey completed, and contrary to what was represented in the public testimony, an AIS is already done. It was submitted to the State uh, Historical Preservation Division back in 2016. Nada. No response. It's over two years. So then in September 2016, um, there was a heavy equipment operator. You know, he was kind of hired by not only by the Olsen Trust, but also one of the, one of the tenants to kind of help clean up that area. And at that time, uh, they had, you know, when the AIS was done in uh, 2016, they had already identified the limits of where the cemetery was. So the bulldozer operator, you know, like when he tried to clear that area, was well beyond that area. But he had inadvertently uh, knocked down one or two headstones in that area. And so that precipitated the, uh, the call to you know, ship D and, and so on and so forth. So the revised archeological inventory survey was prepared, was done then to kind of now reflect a wider area of the, uh, uh, the, the cemetery. Although we didn't have any um, uh, formal review and approval by ship D on the archeological inventory survey, a draft preservation plan was prepared in February of 2017. And that preservation plan had two components. One was the burial, the burial treatment portion, and the other was the preservation portion. That plan is done. It cannot be submitted to Shipti unless and until Shipti approves the archaeological inventory survey. But it's been done, waiting around. So 14 months pass, nothing happens. So in uh, December of 2017, the land board receives uh, an item from Shipti saying that there was a violation. Uh, the Edmund Olson Trust is going to be fined X, you know, X number of dollars. Uh, well, the landowner, Edmund Olson Trust, was not notified of this. And so two, day, two or three days prior to the hearing, uh, the trust's attorney wrote a letter to the land board saying that you got to give us notice. And so at that time, then the land board removed that item from, from the agenda. So it, then comes January, January of 2018. That item also was on the agenda, and it got pulled off because there was representation made that Shipti was going to meet with its attorney and uh, Mr. Olson and Mr. Olson's attorney. So they had a meeting in January. January of 2018. When they had that meeting, Shipti, according to Mr. Uh, Alston, Paul Alston, uh, Mr. Olson's attorney, when they had that meeting in January of 2018, Alan Downer, the Shipti's division chief, basically said that he'll look into it and get back to you. So nothing happened. All of 2018, nothing happened. Finally, in 2019, we asked the planning department, What's the scoop? I mean, like, you know, we want to go ahead with the, pro, you know, with the rezoning. Is not, is, is it they going to respond one way or the other? So they confer with, uh, you know, via email or maybe telecom with the, uh, the ship team. And ship team said, go ahead and process the application. And so it was under that kind of notion or understanding then we had proceeded with the, uh, the application. In the meantime, I asked Mr. Alston, who is Olson's attorney, please check with SHPD and their attorney to find out what's happening. He does in March, still no answer. And this kind of like brings us to like where we are. So planning commission, uh, the, the department reviews the application, the um, commission recommends, and as well as the director recommends that the application be favorably considered. Um, and you know, this is where we are. I, I think like several things that uh, we'd like to make clear. One is that there's no reasonable person 
knowingly would destroy a cemetery or a burial. And let alone somebody like Mr. Olson. You know, to even suggest that Mr. Olson would wantonly, you know, do or commit something like that, I think is ludicrous. Um, the other thing is like, it's not like the applicant's fault. All this delay, it shifted his responsibility. They should have responded way back in December and, or January of 2018. And they haven't done it. So why is now the fault of the applicant? And lastly, I think, um, you know, there is this kind of um, belief that, that this development will destroy a cemetery. Not so. As I mentioned earlier, this whole 39 or 40 acre area, only a portion of it and a small, at, at the corner, is a cemetery. The balance of the property has historically been used for sugarcane and other agricultural activity. And then at that meeting, we heard from an uh, elderly gentleman or an older gentleman, older than me, he remembers growing up as a child in, in Japanese camp because there was all plantation camps up there, Jap Japanese camp, Portuguese camp, Filipino camp, you know. And um, they each had their own grave sites. So one of the, uh, the gentlemen there said he remembers uh, the Jap some of the Japanese graves getting... Uh, relocated to a lie cemetery mm -hmm. but he also said they didn't take all of the remains then um, Gino in Asensio talked about you know there's other grave sites around that area that have not been identified there are other cemeteries other cemeteries yeah that because people were so poor that they couldn't afford to do those nice cement headstones back then it was either guaivi sticks that they made into a cross or just wooden crosses. And over time, that would disintegrate. So their questions from the community was, now if that's known to Shipdi, or is there going to be another archaeological survey to make sure that we don't disrupt any more grave sites? And they were saying that could, you know, Shipdi didn't, even approve the, your burial plan or the archaeological survey yet, and we're moving ahead, and now there may be more grave sites. What, what they're referring to is like not, you know, like having these burials, you know, potential burials, like um, all scattered throughout this 40-acre site. You know, I think it's common knowledge that the, the burials would be within the cemetery and not like, you know, scattered throughout the rest of the property. There, if they were scattered throughout the property, I think it would be very difficult to have like all these historical agricultural uses on the balance. So uh, nevertheless, there is always that potential. So you have like an archeological inventory survey, which kind of identifies as best as you can what uh, features are on the property that require preservation. And for those that require preservation, and in this case here, only in the cemetery, require preservation, then that preservation or burial treatment plan would have to be approved also by Shifty. Tied in with that, and tied in with that, you have like an archeological monitoring plan that's also part of the SHPD protocol. So that monitoring plan is that as you do land disturbance activity over and beyond that preserved area, if there are any inadvertent find, then the protocols call for you gotta stop, notify the, probably the police department and also notify Shipti and the planning department. And then you take appropriate protocol from that point. And if, they, if it's found out to be like a uh, historical you know, um, uh, burial, then I think every effort is gonna have to be made to try to find whether they're any lineal descendants. And if they are not, then they're gonna have to find a place to properly reinter them, whether it's gonna be as is or you know, into a cemetery. Yes, I was asked by the community um, since they didn't see the amendments either yet for me to have this postponed. Actually, they wanted it postponed till Shipti can come in um, and look at the archaeological uh, survey and also the burial treatment plan. And we have a, a certain time frame uh, where we have to you know, move it along, provided that it's a complete application. Uh, but in a sense, that's correct. I mean, the... the Information and commentary we got back from Shipti, Shipti. was... The, the, yeah. you got, they wouldn't pursue right. it. And you know, that, e either that, or if Shipti 
If Shipti doesn't give us any comment, you know, that would also allow us to proceed. You know, technically their rules require them to go up or down, I believe, in 30 days. But because of the nature of what these studies are, you know, we've been, you know, pretty lenient on them. So could the director have said yes, no, or uh, let's do an no, let's do an extension on the application, or he still could have decided let's extend this and get more information. Because from my understanding, we didn't get anything in writing from Shipley. Not an email, not a letter, nothing. It was just a phone call from Shane that said we're not going to pursue this. So was that his decision? Or, you know, that's where I question if it was Shipley's decision or just his alone to make. But again, Shane this is Shane. where everything gets kind of muddy, Shane. yeah, with Shipley. So, um, well, a anyway, in deference to the staff, too, you know, I, I know that there were like email or uh, discussions between the staff and Sean Nale Miley, you know, the, the area resident, um, area archaeological uh, archaeologist. But subsequent to that, in deference to the staff, they said they asked us, "Can you please check with Shipty as well?" Right. And so we did. And Mr. Olson contacted, tried to make contact with Mr. Downer and uh, Mr. Weinoff. And then finally, I believe it was in March of uh, this year, Mr. Weinoff said, like, he talked to Shipti and nothing. Yeah, so it's, and all, all of this is done via phone call. I, I would say at least an email or something. I mean, it's so hard for the community to hear, well, on the phone call, they said go ahead, you know, and was that only that per his personal opinion or was that overall Shipti's opinion? And I, I don't know because we don't have anything in writing. You know, whatever Shipti does, you know, relative to this, I would say at this point in time, I have to say this alleged uh, violation, you know, with the landowner, that has to be, I would recommend, be taken like on another track. Uh, largely because if you make that as a condition or you just hold it off, then, you know, you're kind of bordering on kind of trying to legislate infinity because you never know like when that's going to happen. And even if there is a resolution with, uh, not resolution, but, you know, the, the land board or whomever decide that this is so-called what, what you need to do, uh, that could conceivably be contested, you know, and then you don't know how long that's going to take. I think that, you know, speaking on behalf of the Olsen Trust, they want to get this thing resolved. I mean, you know, they don't want to hang it on. So they were always asking Shipti, what's the situation, what's the situation? Because, sure, you know, there's some amount of culpability on the part of uh, the Olsen Trust, you know, but they maintain that there was also some other people who were using that area. They were like scavenging bottles and they were using place, you know, that place was also been used by some of the homeless that, that could have inadvertently resulted in some of these destructions. So to put the entire burden on, on the Olsen Trust, I think this is where uh, between Mr. Olsen and their attorney, they kind of want to try to work this thing through with Shipti and, and the land board. And when that's going to happen, basically they're waiting for Shipti to come back. My concern here is that Shipti is not responding back to what would appear to be a, a concern. And that puts a landowner kind of in a never-never land because nothing's happening. I'm really uncomfortable at this point in time listening to the reasons why um, I hear the justification why we should move forward because the state is taking so long. But I don't find a reasonable answer for me that we can go beyond our responsibility to make these determinations beforehand. You know, I just have to take away that whole cemetery issue. You know, we've spent most of this discussion talking about the, the grave sites. But that's really, and I don't want to seem flippant about it, but it really is a red herring in all of this. The main thing is we have to look at it from a land use standpoint. And I think that what was there before, I mean, I know this is only part of the larger Sea Brewer development, which called for anywhere from, what, 400 to 800, I'm not too sure, um, properties until it was downzoned by the Greers. Um, this is far less. And I, I think Mr. Olson has proven over, you know, the years, even if he's getting up there in age, uh, that, you know, he's, he's out there to do the right thing. I, I, I find it slightly disturbing that we found this site 
in the process of grading and grubbing. And then we continued to desecrate that site. And, I, and you got to be honest. They found it. They noticed it. They disturbed it. And then by accident or not, did it again. And if that was any one of our families or our people that someone had dropped a tree on or disturbed with a bulldozer, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure we would be up in arms against what had happened and maybe not so forgiving and uh, more of a let it go mentality. And that's just how I feel. If that was my grandma, that's how I'd feel. You know, you folks are recommending something, but we are actual decision makers, and I think we are bound by laws to base our decisions on facts that we have satisfied any kind of impacts <laughs> to historic sites, historic properties, and cultural practices. So I don't really feel comfortable that that's taken place unless we get at least the proper information sent down to us in whatever order that's supposed to be done if the shifty has to wait for a um, negotiated settlement, if that's proper for them before they further opine, then maybe we do have to wait. And I don't know how long that will take, but maybe if we do postpone it today, we can find that out. It just jumped out to me that, you know, uh, in recent history, this was sugarcane land. But the history of our islands tells us that there were people in that space that utilized that land for other things prior to the plantation era. And so I just want to be sensitive to the potential of other EV and other circumstances that might be relevant in the area. Just a few questions, Mr. Fouque. You mentioned in June 2015 there was a clearing of the property. Was there a grubbing permit for that? According to Mr. Um, the chronology that Mr. Cross provided that he had applied, but um, none was um, none was issued and he said that since no stop removal was planned and soil disturbance was expected to be minimal and within the exempt amount um, they proceeded with the felling operations you know of the albizia trees that do not require a grading permit and i do find it bothering that we haven't gotten anything um, in writing to confirm that they aren't pursuing violations but if you read a little bit further um, there is a phone conversation just a couple of months ago in March where Shipty staff indicated that they may be changing course and resurrecting um, pursuance of the violation anyway. So I just have concerns all around and I don't see a rush in having to move this forward to council at this point. In fact, when we were at that meeting, um, Mr. Fuki, as you remember, there was a descendant um, who found out where her great-grandmother was because her sister, I think, or cousin from Honolulu called and said, hey, did you see the news? It's grandma's grave, <laughs> you know? And so um, that was important because we finally found a connection too, and that was part of the, uh, some plan, the burial, I guess, the, the plan that it's put together to, is to find the lineage, uh, lineal descendants. So um, we, we're starting that.